As you find your way back to your seat, uh, I just want to uh, say again, I'm glad that you're here and maybe you're watching online and I'm glad that you're there and safe. And uh, I got to tell you, this I think this is from Jeff <laughs> through his son to me, but um, I learned a new dad joke just now. Someone, because you know I love dad jokes, and they said, what, what, was the, what was the beginning of that joke? When, when does a dad joke what? When does a joke become a dad joke? And the answer, when it becomes apparent. <laughs> Isn't that the best joke you've ever heard in the last minute? It is. It is. Think about it. Huh. I am always looking for new material. So thank you very much for that. Uh, look for the check in the mail. Don't wait by the mailbox. Just look for the check in the mail. Hey, we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke today, Matthew, Mark, Luke, third book, New Testament, page 1026, if you're using the Alive Paperback Bible. Uh, look in that, uh, in that place of Scripture, Luke 2, 1 to 7, um, because it paints a picture for us. It's the story uh, in, uh, in Gospels, uh, I'm sorry, in Luke's Gospel, uh, about how Jesus Christ is born, how that happens, how it comes to be, and the circumstances around that. And uh, it's kind of like... A painting to me. In fact, uh, go ahead and switch the camera view. You'll be able to see this painting no matter where you are, either at home or wherever. Uh, switch to this view. We'll wait for it. There it is. And uh, I actually have four of these and I, that I would like to show you. And the question that I would like to ask you about it is, what can you learn about the painter from looking at the painting? Uh, this author, the author of this painter, uh, his name is Connie. Um, C-A-N-I, and uh, he's a wonderful artist, and he painted this, and we purchased it from him and then had it shipped here. And uh, Jill, where are you? Jill is a framer. Uh, she's in the building. There she is. So um, uh, travel considerations brought to you by Jill's framing department. Um, Jill put this on a frame for us, and it hangs in our living room, except during Advent, where the big uh, the rejoice, adore him sign goes up. But what do you think you know about Connie? From looking at this painting. What are some things? French. Parlez-vous. Pardon? Loves light, yeah? What else? What do you think you might know about Connie from his painting? That's right. Very little. Thank you. Perfect. All right. <laughs> yeah, I'll hand it to you in just a second. So Connie is actually uh, from Mexico, and uh, I think he's a pretty wonderful painter. And what I love about it is I'm drawn to perspective paintings. Do you know what I mean when I say that? So most of the stuff in my house has perspective. Some of the people don't, but my paintings do. <laughs> and, um, and I've always wanted to see the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And the Eiffel Tower, too. Yeah, please. Thanks. After that, I still want your help, yes. <laughs> Give it up for Cheryl, everybody. <laughs> yeah, she has 36 years of her sentence done. <laughs> it is a ministry, that's right. A prison ministry. Oh, <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> yep. Huh, I have a couple follow-up jokes I'll share with you after. <laughs> the author of this painting, her name is Annalise. She is uh, in her mid to late 20s. Uh, she is a, uh, what's the thing in Grand Rapids? Uh, art Prize? Uh, she's an Art Prize artist, and she lives in Wisconsin, and this is one of her paintings. What do you think you might know about Annalise? Pardon? Color, yeah, yeah. Yeah. She's a wonderful redhead, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Jessica's going, whoo! <laughs> there it is. Ginger Club. Sorry, it's Filterless Sunday. You got to know that. What else might you know about Annalise? Pardon? Loves nature. Loves nature. Yeah? And she's happy, someone said? She's a wonderful, happy person. She just got married. Uh, her husband's name is David. And uh, she's an artist who, I don't know what kind of style that is, but you notice it's, it doesn't have those definitive lines, right? It's uh, impression. Yeah, that's the word. And I think this is watercolor. 
And uh, so she did that, and uh, she actually happens uh, to be our son's wife's sister, just so you know. So that's how I learned about Annalise. That's her initials down there, but now she's married, so it's a little bit different. Can I hand this back to you? Thanks. One more quick, two more, three more quick. (laughs) All right, let's change genres a little bit. Go ahead and bring that one up a little closer if you're able to, to zoom in on that one. The artist's name is John, Jonathan for full, J-O-N, John. Tell me what you think about John. (laughs) Yeah, actually, uh, he's not a gamer. Isn't that something you'd think, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you see some of the impression work here in the center, you can see a tree with an apple and a woman's figure and the chasm in the space between the kingdom and the kingdom of darkness. You can even see darkness and light. John happens to be an architect. He is from um, Minnesota, and he is a a deep theologian, writer and reader, uh, who thinks very deeply about this stuff. And because, as an architect, he's able to take what he sees and make it happen on paper. He painted this about 20 almost 20 years ago, and he wouldn't sell it to me. <laughs> but he said, for free, I will um, get a print for it, a litho, so it's just on paper, you know, and then I put it behind glass. I think it's an amazing thing that just helps me think through some of the invisible realities in which you and I exist. The painting tells me not only about John, but a little bit about who we are. And the last painting I want to show you, this one of all the four, potentially might be my favorite. I'll let you see that. See if you can focus in on that. The author of this painter, if you can see right down there in the bottom where he signed it uh, four and a half years ago, his name is Terry. (laughs) Someone you might know. He lives in Hudsonville. Uh, He's about 60 years old, Uh, quite handsome. Um, But is he (laughs) funny? But is he funny? Yep, (laughs) only occasionally, but his friends are hilarious. Uh, If I say this, you'll know where this is from. Wine and canvas, have you ever done one of those things? This is supposed to be those dandelions where the seeds blow away in the wind? Nope, I messed up so bad, I made it into daisies. Those are the fattest dandelions you've ever seen in your whole life. So don't answer this one out loud, but what does this painting tell you about its author, right? Um, Actually, they held this up in class as a demonstration. Uh, She said, this is really good. You must know well how to fix mistakes. (laughs) So anyway, this this is a painting that tells you a little bit about my skill level, which drawing thin lines, forget it. There's nothing in my life that's thin and uh, maybe my hair, (laughs) and that's about it. Um, Let me show you one more, it's up on the screen. It's mostly blue. If you can switch to that view, the last painting. This question isn't so much about the artist. I don't know who made that rendering. It's like a screensaver kind of a thing is all that is. But this is an image of an actual event. And we're not sure of all the details and how it happened, if, there was, if it was a guest room in the basement or the side of someone's house, or if it was actually a stall out in the open. Those are things we don't know, but the author of this event, what does this painting tell you about the author of this historical reality? Couple thoughts, couple words. Sacred, oh, I love that word. That might be the best thing that we've heard this morning. It's, that's a holy, heavy word, sacred. What else? What? Jesus is the focal point. Yeah. Directly under the center of the starlight. Yeah. Under the marquee, as it were. Good. Pardon? Hope. Yeah. Promise kept actually the title of this message, Promise and Fulfillment. 
Did you read ahead? Preston, um, I've served with him for a long time as an elder. He's been an elder in more than this. Uh, in my last church, you were an elder, weren't you? Yeah, you were. And elder of worship, actually. And um, he knows stuff. He's been around the block. Uh, three times. <laughs> him and Adam, <laughs> friends. <laughs> um, not that Adam, the guy from the grocery store. Uh, what else? One more thing. What might this painting tell you about its author of the historical reality? We don't need a detail of the people, but the detail of the subject who is Jesus. Is that pretty close? Thanks, Kat. Yeah. I love how it's impressionist. Is that the word? It, it doesn't give you everything. In fact, the people are, um, what do you call it, when they're just uh, silhouettes. Because they're not the highlight. I think it's amazing that it's simple and profound. And that this outdoors event, maybe, is the thing that opened the door for us to enter into the presence of our Father. Pray with me, and then we're going to jump into the text. This prayer is from Psalm 89. Lord Jesus, your love is great, and it stands firm forever. We consecrate ourselves to make your faithfulness known through all generations. You have determined to make your covenant with us through David, your servant, king. And you keep your promises to us forever and through all generations. The heavens praise your wonder while at the same time we declare your faithfulness. Who, O Lord, is like you? There is none we have beside you. You alone are to be feared greatly for you are mighty and your faithfulness surrounds you. So bless your word today, Lord, to accomplish your purposes by your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. That was from Psalm 89, verses 1 to 8. So Preston was spot on. Promises kept. Were those the two words that you share? It's, it's that. Um, so I fell in love while I was in college. You knew that. His name was Simon Garrett de Graff. <laughs> maybe, maybe I should explain. In 1978, Simon de Graff wrote the book Promise and Deliverance. Promise is kept. Promise and fulfillment. Two books showing the biblical connections of the promises of God and their fulfillment in Christ. And I loved that set of books. It helped me see the connections of how the word of God was full of God's glory and faithfulness. I love that what he said he would do, he did, and he never failed. And Mr. DeGraff helped me understand. And for the first time in my life, I began to swim a little deeper in the word of the Lord to see about what it means that the government would be on his shoulders, for he is the king of a new kingdom and that he will be from the house and lineage of David, God's promise, a righteous branch from David's line, Jeremiah prophesies. And he says it will be a sign to us that he'll be born a virgin, and we will know, he'll know what is just and right, and here's Jesus, a sinless human, a son, just as it was prophesied. God didn't miss a thing in his word. Every detail fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The Gospels actually show me how the promises and plans of God to save his people, uh, they show me about the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us, the one who would come here to be with us in the flesh, born of Mary, all of that fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And what an amazing truth, the way that the Gospels paint the pictures of Jesus' stories, all those things help me to know him. And there's super fun details in all of that because it reminds us that well, like Kat said, it's not just about the silhouettes. It's about the subject, the object of the painting, Jesus. It helps me understand that God is sovereign and God is in control of all history. And he is the one that moves the heart of all humans. And he does it simply by his word. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. This is the word of God about the birth of Jesus Christ. 
in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree. Now, I, you know, I'm, I love imagination. I see scripture like a pop-up book whenever I read it. Characters jump off the page and come to life for me. And J.B. Smoove has ruined the scriptures for me. Do you know that guy? He's the Caesar guy on all the app commercials on your TV. And he's got those glasses with the olive branches. And so now whenever I read, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree. I see J.B. Smoove with his fingers in his spenders, and he's just being lard, uh, large and loud. Anyway, I don't know what Caesar looked like. In those days, Caesar issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And you can just imagine how that went in his office. Let's tax the whole place. And in one Jedi move, his people move out and take others' money. Verse 2, this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And then notice what happened. By his word, everybody moved. Verse 3, and everyone went to their own town to register. Governments. <laughs> I know, right? It's a good thing God commands us to pray for them. They're in place to take care of us and serve us. We should pray for them. But Luke is very clear. It's no wonder that Luke makes this plot line clear. You see, there's a new king. It's not Caesar. The whole coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to be born in Bethlehem is really kingdom versus kingdom. That's the whole context. That's the backdrop. That's the sky behind the crash. Is that a new king? The true God is here. Jesus brings that new kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, and now people have to choose alliance, allegiance. It's a good thing we don't struggle with political kingdoms against the kingdom of God anymore, right? We're beyond that. <laughs> Maybe. So back to the text. Remember, everybody's on the move. Everybody. Here's the Joseph, one of the everybody's. Verse 4. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David. So there it is, big map all the way down to one little city, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. Lineage. This is what Matthew starts with in his gospel. He makes it known to us very clearly that God made a promise to bring a king from David's line, and he kept that promise. So it's not a small commentary. Luke is highlighting the work of God, the promises of God, that the Messiah would be of David. His throne would last forever. He would be a king to emancipate his people. Remember, the big picture is made up of the small pixels, the small details that bring definition to God's plans. Verse 5, so he, that is Joseph, went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. Exactly like the Word of God said. Her firstborn, conceived by the Holy Spirit. It's exactly as was prophesied in Isaiah 7, verse 4, as Gabriel told them in Matthew 1 and Luke 1. So Luke calls attention to God's narrative. He's the one who painted the picture, who, who wrote the story. His historical narrative of our salvation says that a baby is born, a son, in the city of kings to take his father's throne. Psalm 72, 80 and 89. Exactly what Luke had just said in chapter 1, beginning at verse 68. I'll share just four sentences with you. This is Zechariah's song, right? The father of John, Zechariah and Elizabeth, so relatives of Jesus. And um, Zechariah serves as a prophetic figure connecting the Old Testament to the New Testament. Listen to what he says. Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke through his holy prophets, those of ages past, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to grant us deliverance from hostile hands, that we may serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness, before him all the days of our lives. Zechariah was right. The plans of God falling perfectly into place, each pixel exactly the right color, each character in the scene 
perfectly on cue the painting that God imagined and planned is exactly what we see. And it tells us about the author. It tells us about his heart. But there's this one last dynamic that seems to have fallen outside of the plan. Like the event organizer didn't consider all the things or something. Look at it. It's in verse 7, right there on the screen. She wrapped him in cloths. Now remember, this is the king of heaven. And he just gets wrapped in a cloth and gets placed in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. How can an eternal plan end up with no empty rooms and no royal robe, no fancy digs, no room service, no king-size bed or soft towels or a wash basin? None of that. Just a bed of straw. Fit for a king, by the way. You see, John's gospel helps us to understand that the king of heaven came here and we missed it. This is what John said in chapter 1, verse 11. He, speaking of Jesus, was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own didn't receive him. They made no concession because they didn't know. They didn't know the Messiah had come to them. It's interesting, right? I mean, think about it. If people don't know, it's easier to say no. If we don't know who Jesus is, if we don't get to see the painting that shows us the heart of the author, it's easier to say, no. But if people do know, maybe they'll know the heart of God and say yes to Jesus. And they'll say, come into my heart, Lord. Come in to stay. And by the way, that might be Maybe this is where we should say amen. Maybe this is the word for the day. Have you said yes? Yes, Lord, come into my heart. Come in today. Come in to, miss, to stay. Let me show you the hospitality and let you just wander around in all the rooms of my heart, even those secret places, those closets that I just don't show anybody. Isn't that what this story is? God, with all of his hospitality, comes to us in the form of a baby so that we can welcome him in? Maybe that's the word today. How's your heart? Is there any room? Or did you send them to the stable? We should go back to the text because I think here's the interesting part. I asked you the question. It was a bit of hyperbole in a sense. I don't think God missed any details, amen? I think he knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, I think God had it all planned out. The fullness of time, moving people to the city of David, moving all of Israel to their hometowns to be counted, the obvious fulfillment of all of his promises that the king would come from the city of kings. God had it planned down to every last detail. So it's no stretch at all to believe that this too is a part of the plan, that there was no guest room available to him, but that's not a mistake in the script. Jesus was born in a barn on purpose. The king of glory now emptied of his glory on purpose. He was born in a cow shed, placed in a manger, wrapped in not in a royal robe, but with torn strips of cloth. All of it on purpose. It's part of his plan. And then if it is, it's a beautiful plan. So we should look deeply into that painting and learn from it. I wondered about it. I saw that picture, the same one you did, and I wondered about, well, here's some things I learned, some lessons from the barn, as it were, and there are just two. So if you're a note taker, here's number one. Obedience might take you into places and other plans for reasons you're not aware of. You might think something about God or about your own life, and he might have another plan. Joseph and Mary traveled, and they did it at Caesar's command. This was no Apple vacation. They didn't have a travel agent who had it all set up for them. Nobody buddy in a Hawaiian shirt picked them up at the airport and gave them a hot towel for their hands. It's not how it went. Traditionally and reasonably, he was expecting to stay with his family. That's how it was done in that culture at that time. He was supposed to be in the house. But that's not how it worked out. Imagine uh, you're traveling in your third semester of pregnancy and you show up and they say, sorry, <laughs> uh, in the back. And you're doing all this because a foreign government has invaded your land and is now taxing you to build the roads? 
And so you're tired and they send you away. You see, it's part of God's plan. Micah 5 prophesied about that. Micah 5 prophesies this location. Um, let me quote. Bible scholars have concluded from much research that hundreds of years before Jesus was even born, more than 300 prophecies were recorded to tell of his coming, his life, his journey to the cross, the power of his resurrection. All of these prophecies point to the exact location and circumstances and timing of Jesus Christ's birth. That's from crosswalk.com. In fact, if you go to crosswalk.com and search on 10 Bible verses that prophesied Jesus Christ's birth, you're going to see this wonderful page laid out, just like Preston said, promise kept, prophecy fulfilled. It's kind of a cool page. Obedience might take you to places that you didn't even imagine. How many of you are in a different spot than you thought you would be a year ago? Mm Mm-hmm. The second thing, real quick, the hospitality of the barn is a means for God to proclaim his peace. I think the barn is full of the wonderful condescension of God. You see, because he comes to us in acceptable ways. Listen closely. This is my favorite sentence for the whole morning. It's amazing to me how God fits into our lives before he asks us to fit into his. It's amazing to me how God fits into our lives before he asks us to fit into his. Before he calls someone to follow him, he comes to them. He dines with them. He accepts them and makes it a low threshold event to come into his presence. And he doesn't say, if you're going to show up, show up with a tithe, uh, bring a sacrifice, and let's make sure there's pomp and circumstance. You see, all those things he provides He took care of all of that. He just wants you to show up. Just come and meet Jesus. Did you know that that is exactly why Alive, this building, is just an old library business office? Did you know that? This is where you used to pay your water bill. This used to be the cop shop and the fire station. We did that on purpose because of this old converted office building is easily accessible that no matter who you are or what you have, or what you've done, it's easy to meet Jesus here. It reminds me of the painting that we saw. The shepherds, they've been more, they were probably more comfortable in a barn than a temple. Come on, think about it. They were uneducated, unexpected. They were the the lowly of society. I think the Latin is doofus. Um, It's not true. Imagine if they tried to go to a palace. They wouldn't get past the front gate. So I think Jesus showed up in a barn. It was good for the shepherds. I think it was good for the wise men, too. I mean, they learned in the barn and in the stable or maybe the apartment. I don't know. Uh, We don't know all the details about where Jesus was. That not all royalty lives like royalty. Ha, come on. He's the king of kings and lord of lords, and he shows up as a vulnerable baby. The wise men, they were educated. They had tons of expectations. They were highly revered. And I wonder if they expected God to match all of that. That God's son, the Messiah, would be in a purple robe with velvet pillows and 49 full-time staff to take care of them. I wonder. Can only royalty or high position save you? Can only someone who is important in our social strata, is that the only kind of person that can save you? That's not at all what's in our confessions. What kind of savior must you then look for? One who is truly man and truly God. Truly man to bear our sin because human flesh sins so only human flesh can pay for human sin. And truly God to sustain and withstand the punishment of God against sin and then in all power to be resurrected from death. It doesn't say someone in a palace, but the Holy Son of God who was born in a barn so that we might have access. Maybe God was teaching them something about himself that they needed to know, and their paintings, their picture books, their quiet books in church (laughs) didn't have the right pictures in them. They both learned that the Christ is the humble and suffering servant who emptied himself of his glory. That made it okay for the shepherd to be in his presence. 
You see, they were lowly and despised and rejected as citizens. And it sounds a lot like the promise and prophecy about Jesus. And they made it vital for royalty, the upper crust, to be in his presence, to learn of the measure and extent of God's love to save us, that he would stop at nothing, even setting aside his glory and benefit so that we might be saved. So the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they make it very clear. Jesus' own words, he didn't come here for those who have it all together, for the clean and the righteous. He said he came here for the sick, for those who need a doctor. And I don't know about you, but my soul is sin sick. And the prognosis is death apart from Christ, amen? I need him. Maybe the hospitality of God, the humility of Christ, is the perfect way to proclaim peace. It draws in the lowly. They're greeted and welcomed with kindness and patience and quietness. And it draws in the high and the mighty who are greeted with unbelievable power guarded in meekness. And it changed them both. And that's the good news for today, that no matter who you are, there is only one way to be saved. And you know his name. Say it out loud. His name is the object of the painting, the focal point of the story of God. And he has come for all humankind to see. Can you see him? Can you see him welcoming you? Um, for those of you guys who are operating the screens, I'm going to skip ahead. It's after 11 already. Okay, so we're going to skip the next 19 pages. Uh, I'll let you know where we are. Okay, just follow along. Don't worry. How has the humility of Christ helped you? Has it helped you to receive him and to learn of his humility towards you? I mean, in spite of it all. I mean, and you know the list that he has. He knows your list of stuff. And he's checked it twice. That was fun. I wrote that yesterday. <laughs> he's checking it twice. And the reason he's checking it twice is he says, yep, I died for that one. And I died for that one. I died for that. Select all. Yeah, amen. Come on. There's some gospel in that dumb little line. And that's how we get peace. Jesus Christ came here to proclaim peace. He said, the peace I give you is not like the world gives. That's the painting. And now we get to tell others of this gentle shepherd who knows you by name, who will never abandon you, the Lamb of God who is also the Good Shepherd with no detail overlooked, the baby, the barn, the lowly birth, his suffering and temptation, everything is on purpose because it took him to the cross where he could take the curse of sin upon himself to take my place and yours in the position of the one who is guilty to stand in the gap between us and the Father. That was his plan the whole time to remove the enmity we have with God, to remove our punishment and give us peace. So let's be brutally honest. The scripture says, apart from Christ, we remain dead in our sins. The gift of hospitality brings us into his presence and says, you'll be okay. I invite you this season to welcome him in and know peace that surpasses understanding. Know it deeply. It'll change who you are. Amen? Amen. Let's go all the way to the end. Let's go to closing prayer. Father God, we need peace. We need you. The storms rage in our hearts and in our minds as we look for you in the darkness, in our weakness, in our ignorance. And sometimes it feels like you're inaccessible to us. You're too grand and glorious for the likes of us. God, if you really knew me, would you still love me? But your painting, your picture tells me you do. In the pictures you paint with your word and in the word Jesus Christ, we see you in those lowly places all the time. At the tax collector's house, in the leper colonies, in the temple where you were surrounded by sinners who were attracted to you because you give peace. Lord Jesus, help us to understand this Advent to prepare our hearts for your presence, to extend hospitality to you, to accept the hospitality you give us. Help us to trust you even when we can't see you.
or know what you're up to. Lead us by day, protect us by night, show us the way, show us the way home to your heart. By your Holy Spirit, may we know your heart and understand your word. May we believe your promises and trust in Jesus alone for our salvation. And by that same Spirit, may we become peacemakers, proclaiming the peace of Christ wherever we go. So thank you for remembering your covenant to us, for treating us with mercy, for condescending to who we are and what we need, for keeping your promises. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray and believe. Amen.